Well, when I was a uh, junior in high school, um, I developed a crush on a girl on my tennis team, but I had no idea how to have a relationship with a girl, and so I consulted with my friends, and they began to uh, advise me. Uh, the first thing you have to do uh, if you want a relationship with a girl is you have to actually talk to said girl. Um, so they encouraged me, why don't you just stick around after your match, watch her play her match, then you can go up to her afterward and tell her, hey, nice match, and see how she reacts. So I did, and she smiled. Good sign, they said. I said, now, if you really want to know, though, if she likes you, prom is just a month away, you got to ask her out. And I told them, like, there's no way that's happening. They said, no, no, no. So they did some, some behind-the-scenes sort of intel for me. They confirmed with her friends that if I asked, she would definitely say yes. There's no risk here. We've got it on good authority. So sure enough, I asked, and she did say yes. Nice. Great, they said. So now my friend said, um, but it's going to be super awkward if you just show up at prom in a month. Having had two conversations, that's counting nice match as a conversation. <laughs> um, so they said, here's what you do. You ask her out again for this weekend and uh, take her to dinner, take her to a movie. During the movie, you got to try and hold her hand and see how she reacts to that. And uh, little by little, my friends were you know, teaching me how to have a relationship with a girl. Of course, looking back, I wish that they had included details like uh, become friends with her first um, or earn the trust of her parents, important things like that. But they were just dumb teenage boys like me. But if high school girls are you know, complicated, mysterious, wonderful, also pretty scary, and thus navigating a relationship with them feels intimidating, how much more so when we're talking about a relationship with the complicated, mysterious, wonderful, also kind of scary creator and sustainer of the entire universe, God. Fortunately, though, we've got a far better counselor from whom to get our advice. We've got God himself who has revealed to us how to have a relationship with him in his word, the Bible, and particularly this morning, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 24, if you want to begin turning there in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one of those at the info bar as well. But as you turn, let me just remind you, for the first five, the last five chapters, the last five Sundays now, we've been examining God's law, these Ten Commandments, and then an additional 95 laws that help explain them, called the Book of the Covenant, all of which God gave to Israel, his people, most importantly, to show them how to stay in good relationship with him. Remember, God had called Israel his firstborn son in chapter 4. Like any good parent, though, God has certain expectations of his children. Polly and I, we expect our kids to treat us with respect, to treat one another well, be kind. God wants the same for his children. Love me, love one another. This sums up the whole law, according to Jesus. I want a love relationship with you. And this morning in Exodus 24, God is going to formalize that love relationship with his people by confirming or ratifying his covenant with Israel. Covenant is a promise. It's a promise of relationship. Those of us who are married here have made such a promise to our spouse. I'm in this for the long haul. Come what may. Those of you who are members of this church, you've made a similar covenant relationship to this church. And God had already entered into a covenant relationship with Israel, specifically with a man named Abram back in Genesis 12. But as Israel developed, matured, the relationship changed as we are going to see this morning, such that by Exodus 19 through 23, some 500 years later, God now deems his people ready to receive the gift of his law, so-called Mosaic covenant, Moses' covenant. And Chapter 24 here, it's really the culminating moment at which that covenant is solidified and goes into effect. This is God's wedding ceremony with his people, if you will, where they both stand up at the altar, they make their vows, covenant relationship becomes official. And it's going to teach us six things about what it means to have a relationship with God. And so we'll begin by reading the passage together. If you would stand with me once again as you're able 
for the reading of God's word. Exodus 24, and I invite you to hear the word of God. Then God said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near and the people shall not come up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and he put it in basins and half the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of all the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and he threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord your God has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up into the mountain of God and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you and behold Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, God called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of all the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. This is the word of God. Let's be to God. You may be seated. So the first thing we learn here about how to have a relationship with God is that you must be called. Verse 1, God calls Moses to come up to himself along with his brother Aaron, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, 70 of the elders of Israel. And then in verse 2, God invites Moses specifically to come near to him. God, uh, Moses didn't just wake up one day and think to himself, you know, I, I think I'll start a relationship with God today. Rather, God had to be the one to call Moses, to make the first move. Remember, he did that all the way back in chapter 3 at the burning bush. God called to Moses out of the burning bush. Moses, Moses. And friends, it has to happen the exact same way for Everyone today who enjoys a relationship with God. In John 6, Jesus informs us that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That the only way that you and I can come to Jesus in relationship for salvation is if God the Father calls us to himself. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it in the book of Ephesians. He said, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, in love, because remember, God wants a love relationship with us. In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Translation, the only way for us to be saved is if God, in his love, his undeserved grace, if God wills it, predestines it, chooses us, calls us to himself. Nobody in this room, uh, looking around, 
I don't know everybody super well, but I'm going to go on on a limb. Nobody in this room could just decide right now that you're going to have lunch with the President of the United States today and go out in the foyer, pick up your phone, uh, got him on speed dial, make a call and make that happen. I don't think anybody in this room could do that. How much less so could you or I hope to be the ones to establish a relationship with the almighty, sovereign God of the universe? It's not going to happen. We can't. He has got to be the one to make the call. It's his prerogative, his and his alone. As God is going to make clear to Moses in just a few chapters from now, chapter 33, he says, I will be gracious to who I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy to who I'll show mercy. I'm the one calling the shots here. And God says, it's not going to be in response to you either. Anything that you've done. God says, it's not like I'm waiting up here to see who will obey me and who won't, and then I'll choose. No, before the foundation of the world, Paul says. As Moses reminds us later in Deuteronomy 7, he says, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasure possession. It was not because you were more in number than any of the other nations that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. He says, actually, you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it was because the Lord loves you. There it is again, God's love. Like if I ask those of you who are parents in this room, why do you love your kids? Out of all the children on the face of the earth, why these kids? You wouldn't say because of all the children out there, these are the greatest. These are the smartest, the coolest, the best. Now you may think that. That's not why you love them. At least I hope it's not why you love them. That's not why God loves his kids anyway. God says, it, you weren't the greatest, not numerically speaking, and frankly, not in terms of your obedience to me. God says, no, I love you simply because you're mine, because I chose you. That's it. I consider who God calls to himself here in verse 1. Moses was an orphaned murderer who begged God to send anyone but him to rescue his people. Aaron, later in chapter 32, he's going to lead the Israelites in the greatest, most egregious act of idolatry in their history, the golden calf. And Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they follow in his footsteps. They will later have to be executed for their rebellion against God. These guys aren't exactly the Mount Rushmore of faithfulness to God. And yet, God chooses them. 2 Timothy 1.9 reiterates this. God saved us and called us not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us freely as a gift in Christ Jesus before the ages even began. There it is again. God made his choice before he even created us, before he created anything, because God didn't want there to be any confusion. He was, he's going to prove his choice wasn't based on anything in us, friends. Not your goodness, not your faithfulness to him, but rather his choice was based solely on everything in him, his goodness and his faithfulness to you. And, and friends, that is really good news because that means that God's not going to unchoose you when you inevitably screw up. God won't uncall you any more than God can unlove you. Again, parents, do you quit loving your children when they mess up? Of course not. And how much more confident can we be then that God, our perfect, perfectly loving Heavenly Father, will continue to love us, to choose relationship with us despite all of our failings? Praise God for his gracious, unmerited love for his calling us into relationship with him. Amen? Number two, and this, this one's going to sound at first like an immediate contradiction of everything I just said. Just getting that out there. Hang with me. To enjoy a good relationship with God, we must be obedient. We must be obedient. Now, Moses evidently descended Mount Sinai after receiving the book of the covenant from God because now God calls him back up the mountain in verse 1. But first, in verse 3, we hear Moses reported all the words of the Lord to the people. And here's how they respond. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words of the Lord has spoken, we will do. Ten commandments plus the 95 laws on top of it, we're going to obey. Now, Commentators take very different interpretations of this. 
Some will say Israel's being rash here. They are too hasty to agree. They should have stopped and counted the cost uh, of obedience. Others will say well, Israel is too self-assured. They are overly confident and optimistic in their ability to actually keep the law. And they chastise. And, and both of those assessments may be true. However, I want to uh, emphasize a third and more sympathetic reading here that simply sees Israel as trying to be faithful. Put yourself in their shoes. If you saw, if you were at the foot of the mountain, you saw this whole mountain shaking, you're hearing booming voices of thunder and peelings of lightning. These are my commandments, you know. Would you respond by saying, okay, God, just give me a few days to consider it, you know, uh, read over the fine print, uh, maybe suggest some revisions to the covenant, and I will get back to you. No, Israel is not in a position to negotiate here. So when, when God says jump, you don't even say how high. You don't question at all. You just jump. And so that's what they do. Israel simply says, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. Whatever you say, it's your covenant. We'll do it. And then in verse 4, Moses writes down all the words of the Lord because God is not just calling this generation of Israelites to obey, and these laws are for all generations. And then if we skip down to verse 7 now, Moses takes this book of the covenant and he reads it in the hearing of all the people, and they repeated, once again, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So when I perform weddings, I send the bride and groom a copy of the entire ceremony, including especially their vows before the big day arrives, because I don't want there to be any confusion. I want them to understand exactly what it is that they are signing on for when they say, I do. Moses here, he recites God's law for them in verse 3, so they would understand the terms and the conditions of God's covenant. And now in verse 7, he reads it for them all over again, so they can actually agree to it. We do. It also stresses, by the way, the importance of our obedience. Because remember, anytime the Bible repeats itself, it's, it's for emphasis. God's saying, if you, if you want to stay in good relationship with me, you really got to obey me. Jesus said, repeat it for emphasis. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3. This is love for God, that we keep his commandments commandments. You want a love relationship with me, God says, obey me. Perhaps you're here this morning and you are not sure if you have a relationship with the Lord yet. You're in luck. God has given us a litmus test to know, to discern whether or not we've truly come into a relationship with him. 1 John 2 verse 3. We know that we have come to know him, to know God intimately, a personal relationship with him. If we keep his commandments. You say, wait a minute. I thought you just told us in point number one that God calls us into relationship not because of our obedience, but simply as a result of his own gracious, free, loving choice. And that's true, but this is where we have to remember the context of Exodus in redemptive history. A few weeks back, I used the analogy of my own kids, hopefully helpful in, in helping us conceptualize of this. I love all my kids. I, I think I have really good relationships with all three of them, but my relationship with Bo, my six-month-old, is very different than my relationship with Elijah, my three-year-old, is very different than my relationship with Ellery, my seven-year-old. Bo has no rules. Right? Bo can pull out my hair, my, my arm hair, my beard <laughs> hair. He can pull it out. Bo can pee all over me. And I'm not going to treat him. I'm not going to relate to him any differently. Now, if Elijah pees on me, if Elijah pulls out my hair, we're going to have some issues. And if Ellery did it, I'm not even going to go there. Now, the same is true of God. God's love for his children hasn't changed since he first made his covenant with Abram 500 years ago. But as Israel has matured, developed, so too is the relationship. And now God is telling them, no more arm hair pulling, Right? It's time to establish some, some family rules around here for what it's going to mean to belong to me. So all of God's unconditional love from point number one, it's still there, just like if Elijah pulled my hair in the foyer today on purpose, thinking it was funny, I would still love him, right? But what, 
love looks like changes over time. At a certain stage in a child's development, love looks like spanking. Hebrews 12, 6 says the Lord disciplines the one he loves. God isn't loving Israel any less by giving them rules here to follow, by enforcing those rules with discipline if they don't obey. If anything, God is proving he loves them more because relationships are supposed to evolve into eventually a two-way street. That's what relationships are. It's a give and a take. I may not love Ellery more than I love my, my younger two kids, but I certainly share a deeper you know, depth of relationship with her because you know, there's a give and a take. She, she's bringing her own love into our relationship. God is giving Israel that kind of opportunity here with them to share in this deeper, more mutual, more mature relationship with them. And friends, he's offering you and me the same thing this morning. But it means that we must obey him. It means that because he's gone and we are not, the relationship has got to be on his terms, not ours. Which makes point number three all the more important. To have a relationship with God, we must be forgiven. You must be forgiven. Isn't it telling that the very first thing God instructs Moses to do here in verse four, after writing down his law, is to build an altar on which he can offer sacrifices to God in verse 5. Philip Ryken explains, so sinners can only worship a holy God on the basis of a sacrifice. People worshiped God long before there was a temple or even a tabernacle. He's going to give the instructions on how to build a tabernacle here in the chapters to come. But even before that, they worshiped, but never worshiped him. People have never worshiped God without an altar. Check the Bible. When Noah and the patriarchs worshiped God, they always started by building an altar, even before Noah, Cain and Abel, whole context for the story is what? Sacrifice. God's acceptance of Abel's offering, not Cain's. Even before that, inside the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, they're delivered from the death that they rightly deserve because of their sin against God. Why? Presumably because God himself made a sacrifice to himself on their behalf. That's where he got the animal hides that he clothed them in. The practice of sacrifice is as old as the practice of sin. And it has to be, because the, it's the only way for guilty people like you and me to be restored to right relationship with a holy and perfect God. We must be forgiven somehow. And according to the Bible, Hebrews 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness for sin. Why is that? Why do we need forgiveness in the first place? And why does it have to entail blood? Well, first, we need forgiveness because, thinking back to point two for a second, God deserves our unfailing obedience. Continue the analogy. Polly and I, we, we gave our kids the gift of life. We feed them, we house them, we clothe them, we care for them, love them, provide nurture. We spoil our kids lavishly. And so if I just simply ask my kids to pick up their toys, just pick up after yourself, that's it. And they respond by asking, why? You see what a slap in my face that is. Right? How much more so then when God who is the source of all life, the source of all love and care and provision, God who sustains the entire universe by the word of his power, we're told. When God asks us to do something, how much more obliged are we to obey him without question? God deserves and he demands our unfailing, absolute obedience, unquestioned. But that also makes it all the more offensive when we disobey him. New analogy, speaking of a slap in the face, right? If, so, if, you walk, if someone walked up to you in the foyer after church today and smacked you in the face as hard as they could, I don't care how good of friends you thought you were with them. I don't care how much you know, past history of good relationship there might be. You're not just going to say, well, that hurt. Where are we meeting up for lunch? <laughs> Clearly, a rift has been formed between you that has to get mended somehow before that relationship can continue and move forward. That's what the Bible says our sin does to our relationship with God, Isaiah 59, 2. Your sins have made a separation between you and your God. Your iniquities have hidden his face from you so that he no longer hears you. It breaks relationship. We must be forgiven. So, why the blood? Why the blood? Two reasons, the significance of blood and its symbolism. Blood is significant. What is more important than blood? What's more costly, more valuable 
than blood. Nothing if you're a mammal. Because as God reminds us in Leviticus 17.11, the life, the very life of a creature is in its blood. And so God says, I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. That brings us to the symbolism of blood. Blood represents life. It's the source of life. We even have this term, life blood, to refer to something's essence, its source of strength and vitality. You lose enough of it, you lose enough blood, life is over, right? Game over. God is our lifeblood. God deserves our whole lives, our heart, mind, soul, strength, every part of us, completely and freely surrendered back to him in grateful obedience. But sin is us refusing to give that to him. It's when we hold on to a part of our life for ourselves. God, you can have my Sunday mornings. I'm going to hang on to Friday and Saturday nights. God, you can have my relationships except for this one. I'm not really going to invite you into this one. God, you can have my past. I'm not ready to surrender my future to you yet. God, I'll, I'll open my schedule to you, maybe even my heart to you. I, I'll open my heart in prayer. I'll open your Bible in faith. I might even open my hands in service to you, but God, don't ask me to open my wallet, my checkbook. In all sorts of ways, we give God less than our whole lives that he deserves. And so God gives it for us on the altar to make atonement, to make substitution for our souls by means of blood, precious, valuable, life giving, symbolizing blood, to pay God back for the life that we owed him but failed to offer him. And in that way, sacrifice takes on an additional meaning then. As we look at this dying animal, this is how we all would have worshipped here on Sunday morning, 2,000 years ago, before Jesus, you would have brought your pets up here, and we'd have an altar right here, and instead of preaching, I'd have, I'd have a knife, and you would watch the, the thrashing, gasping for air, bleeding out, all of the life slowly draining from, from your pet's eyes as we're supposed to identify with that animal. Like, that should have been me. But for the grace of God, I'd be the one paying for my own sins right there, my own life on the altar. That's what I deserve, death. And that's exactly what the sacrifice Represented, particularly in the context of a covenant making ceremony. The Hebrew verb used making a covenant is karath, to cut a covenant, because the two parties would bring their animals, they cut them in half, they'd lay them on either side, and then they'd walk together down the trail of blood that was formed between the animals' halves, symbolically declaring, May God do likewise to me if ever I should break this sacred covenant between us. That's how you made a covenant in antiquity. A blood oath covenant. That was the scene in Genesis 15 when God first forged his covenant with Abraham with one important difference. Do you remember? God caused a deep sleep to fall over Abram and then God alone walked the blood trail because God was making a unilateral, unconditional promise to Abram to be his God irrespective of Abram's obedience. Regardless of whether Abram held his end of the bargain up or not, God was going to be his God. A bow can pull out all the arm hair he wants. I'm not going anywhere. For now. For, there may come a day when continuing to pull my arm hair will cost my son. I pray, of course, that it doesn't come to that. That I never have to sit my son down and explain, Bo, you just can't keep living under my roof eating my food, borrowing my car, and then pulling out my arm hair for fun. And look at what Moses does here with the blood now in Exodus 24. He takes half of it and he throws it on the altar in verse 6 to symbolize this is God's end of the covenant, reminiscent of Genesis 15. But then Moses takes the other half in verse 8, he takes the rest of the blood and he throws it on who? 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 The people on, on y'all, right? Do you see God's relationship now with his people? It, it, it totally changed. It's become a two-way street. This is a massive, massive change in redemptive history. Now the Israelites are entering into a bilateral, conditional covenant. If they continue to sin, they've got blood on their hands. 
if they continue to be disobedient going forward, God will by no means hold them guiltless. The Mosaic Covenant, it is two-way street, conditional. What did God promise them back in chapter 19? He said, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession. And then last week, in chapter 23, what did God say? I'm sending my angel to bring you into the promised land. If you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to you, an enemy to your enemies, and a help to you. I will bless you. God says, I will hold up my end of the bargain, guide you, guard you, bless you, if you will hold up your end of the bargain. Obey me, keep my covenant. And as we will see, that if, two, those two little letters, that is the biggest two-lettered word in the English language, if. The blood here is foreshadowing. It's a reminder that while, yes, we ought to obey God, we must obey him if we want to stay in good relationship with him at the end of the day it's a reminder we have all failed to they see the blood on the altar see the blood on their clothes they're reminded i'm stained i've disobeyed and i stand in need of god's forgiveness which only comes by the shedding of blood you've got to be covered in the blood washed in the blood and ultimately we needed a better sacrifice that could secure for us a more lasting forgiveness an eternally secure relationship with a holy God. And we're coming to that. But number four, and we'll move quickly on these last three points. In order to enjoy a relationship with God, we must be humble. Must be humble. Verse nine, then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. They saw God. Let that sink in. They saw God. Now, those of you who have read through Exodus before are thinking, wait a minute, how? How is that possible? Because in chapter 33, Moses is going to ask to see God. He says, please show me your glory. And God's reply is, sorry, Moses, you can't, for a man shall not see me and live. I'm just too holy. I will melt your face off. So how does Moses do it the first time here in chapter 24? How did he see, how did all the elders see God and survive? Well, if we compare the two passages more carefully, we examine God's words in, verse, in chapter 33 more closely, what God specifically says there is, he says, you cannot see my face and live. And so if we look back at the description Moses gives us of God in chapter 24, we realize he doesn't really describe God at all, does he? Look at what he describes. He says, and I saw there under his feet a pavement, of sapphire stone, like heaven and its purity. He's, he's describing the road that God walks on. Apparently, that's, that's all he was able to manage a glimpse of. God made even the road that he walked on so blindingly holy that Moses and the elders, they couldn't bear to lift their eyes any higher than the soles of God's feet. They definitely couldn't see his face. Why? Were they just... Too scared to lift their eyes? Did God prevent them in his mercy? Or I think they're in the presence of God himself. These men were suddenly overwhelmed by a sense of their own unworthiness to behold God in all his majesty and splendor. Like the prophet Isaiah, when he was given a vision of the Lord, remember in, in Isaiah's case, it was just the train of God's robe filling the temple that he could manage to see, God's clothing. It was It was all Isaiah could bear before he cried out, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That is our right response when we understand just how holy God is, how sinful we are. When you're in the presence of that much beauty and purity, perfection, you can't help but recognize your own ugliness and uncleanness and sin. So a relationship with God, the real God, the God of your own making, The God of the Bible, it will necessarily humble us. And God requires that kind of humility from us before God will even let us into the relationship, before he'll even give us a glimpse of him. Who gets to see God according to Jesus and the Beatitudes? He said, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the the humble, for they shall see God. Jesus said, unless you humble yourselves like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Second Chronicles 7, God says, if my people humble themselves, then I will hear them from heaven, listen to their prayers. 
Jesus, over and over again, said it's not the, the healthy that need the doctor. It's the sick. You've got to humble yourselves. Realize you're sick. He said, who went home justified? The, the, the tax collector or the Pharisee who said, praise God, I'm not like that guy. Or the tax collector who, who ripped his clothes, beat his chest, said, have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. He got justified. Passage after passage, attesting that only the humble can enjoy real relationship with the Lord. Number five, if we want a relationship with God, we must be befriended, befriended by him. That's how these guys managed to survive seeing God. That's why God did not lay his hand on them in verse 11. It's because he had befriended them. He had invited them into relationship, intimate relationship. We hear they ate and drank with God. They shared a fellowship meal with him. This is, this is an intimate thing. Who do you invite over to sit around your dining room table? I mean, that's probably reserved for family and very close friends. This goes beyond point number one, where we're called. This is, that would have been enough. It would have been enough for you and me, Moses, and the rest to be chosen by God at all. Any kind of relationship would be uh, undeserved to be God's servants. It would be our highest joy and privilege merely in this life to be God's slaves. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples on the night when they were gathering, the night before he was crucified around his dining room table, what Jesus said, he said, I called you to be my disciples. I chose you to be my servants, but now I no longer call you servants, but I call you what? Friends. I call you my friends. It's reminiscent, too, of the parable of the prodigal son. This wayward son who wished death on his father by asking for an advance on his inheritance and then promptly squandered it all, wakes up face down in a pig trough, scavenging for food, and he, he finally comes to his senses and thinks, you know what, maybe I'll just go home. Maybe, maybe my father can find it in his heart to forgive me, to accept me, obviously not as a, as a son anymore. I've lost that right. I've lost that privilege. But maybe he can, he can forgive me enough to accept me as a slave. I can serve him, pay off my debt, earn his forgiveness. And while the sun is a long way off on the horizon, now head hung, tail between his legs, practicing his apology, what does the father do? He comes running out down the road to embrace him, to welcome him home, not as a servant, but as a son. As a son, behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are, brothers and sisters, children of God. Lastly, number six, to stay in relationship, good relationship with God, we must abide. We must abide, verses 12 through 18. We won't reread the whole passage, but just consider with me all of the abiding language that we find in these last seven verses. Verse 12, God invites Moses to come up on the mountain and wait. And so verse 14, Moses instructs the elders, you all wait here for, for us, me and Joshua, while we go up. Most significantly in verse 16, the Hebrew word here for what the glory of the Lord did on Mount Sinai, where it says dwelt, it literally means to rest or to settle down, abide. So God abides on the mountain for six days. So too, God makes Moses abide. He makes Moses wait in verse 16 until the seventh day, the holy day, before Moses is allowed to enter into God's Shekinah glory. And once he does, verse 18, we hear Moses remained there, how long? 40 days and 40 nights. That's a lot of abiding. There's so much that we could say here, but I just want to leave it with this. In a relationship, there's no substitute for abiding, is there? I mean, for someone who has been there with you through thick and thin, hours upon hours of relationship, year after year, the good and the bad, that is the stuff that relationships are made of. Abiding. And friends, God desires that kind of relationship with you this morning. Here is Jesus' invitation to you. Would you listen to the words of Jesus? He says, abide in me, and I in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing 
He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Do you want joy this morning? Psalm 1611 tells us how to get it. It says, in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. At God's right hand are pleasures forevermore. All we've got to do is abide there. Be with God. You'll be joyful. This all sounds really nice. And it would be. But it brings us to a major problem here as we wrap up. Twist ending. Namely, that we don't. We don't abide. You and I don't abide with God. We fail to consistently every single day, don't we? We look elsewhere for our joy and we decide, I'm going to abide there instead. Maybe, maybe this will bring the joy that I'm, I'm searching for. As a matter of fact, we don't take any of these six steps toward a relationship with God, do we? Think about it for a moment. We can't accomplish any of the six of these. We are either passive with half of them. We must be called, be forgiven, be befriended by God. He does all the action. We're passive recipients. Or we're just plain insufficient for the task altogether. You and I are not obedient enough to stay in God's good graces on our own. We're not nearly as humble as we ought to be in light of all God's holiness, all our sinfulness. And we fail daily to abide in him. So what then? Close your Bibles, let's pray. No. What, what does all of this show us about what it means to be in relationship with God? Friends, what it shows us is that establishing, maintaining, sustaining, lasting a, in a relationship with God, it all must be totally dependent on Him, on His gracious choosing, giving us the obedience that we, that we can't give him on our own, on him empowering us, on him forgiving us when we fall short, on him humbling us. And friends, in giving us his own son, Jesus Christ, God has secured that relationship with him once and for all. Jesus calls us to himself. He says, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. I know them, relationship, and I give them eternal life. Jesus empowers us to actually obey God. The Bible says without faith in Christ, it's impossible to please God, to obey him. Impossible. You can try all you want. But Jesus actually empowers us to obey him. The Bible says he equips us, Hebrews 13, with everything good that we may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Christ Jesus. Christ at work in you, through you, to please his own Father. And even when we don't live unto the Spirit, live unto Christ, even when we still live back to our old sinful ways and our flesh, when we fall short, what? Jesus forgives us. He's the one who purchased our forgiveness once and for all in his sacrificial death in our place, atonement on the cross. Jesus humbles us. He humbles the proud, but he exalts the humble. Jesus befriends us, not just servants, not even just friends, but brothers and sisters. Jesus is the one who adopts us, makes us God's children. And even when we're prone to abide elsewhere, Jesus still promises to abide with us. Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He says, behold, I am with you. How long? Always, to the end of the age. I'm not going anywhere. Pull all the arm hair you want. I'm here to stay. Friends, don't you want that kind of a security in your relationship with God? Praise God that our, our security, our, our status, our standing before God isn't based in anything in us, our goodness, our faithfulness, but in everything that Christ Jesus has done for us. His faithfulness, his goodness, his perfection, his fulfilling the law that you and I never could. Amen.